Actually, I put some green shit on my face. Well. And, and we're live. Yay. That happened. Hello, everybody. Hmm. Yeah, there's the email notification. There we go. Okay. I just needed to refresh. Yay. Hi, I thought... everybody. <laughs> We're back at home today. Bouncing back and forth between here and the studio. I'm going to be in the foreground for a little while ironing because there is some specialty fabric from the wedding suit I made last year that needs a little bit of ironing before it can turn into particular face masks. So, hi. I'm in the chat and as always watching questions come through. Krista is always watching. <sighs> I wonder if I can lower this down so I can sit. It's been kind of a high activity day. There we go. Yeah. Well, you had a, a photo shoot this morning. It's true. Well, 1 p.m. I, I mean, 1 well, p.m. This afternoon. Yeah. It counts as morning in these times. But yeah, the Keen Sentinel over in New Hampshire, uh, are they're going to run a piece on mask makers. And they were very kind about how they asked for photographs and that they, you know, said, hey, our photographer will respect social distancing, et cetera. And he did. And it was, yeah, it was a good interaction. And the interview itself was done. Yes. It was a great interaction. It's always nice to be interviewed by someone who starts by confirming your pronouns. Like, ah. I just realized that I need to do one of those streaming etiquette things that I don't always remember to do, which is turn off email notifications. So I'm just muting my computer. <laughs> well, sound off in chat if you're here. Say something. Let us know what you're doing. Yeah. What you're up to this rainy Saturday daytime. And by partially rainy, snowy yeah, Saturday by, daytime. By, by rainy, we mean we woke up to snow this morning. I went out at, when did I go out? Noon? Ish. Yeah. There was still snow on the windshield. Yeah, there's still snow on the, you know, it's melting, but. <laughs> it's not okay. It's not okay. It's the end of April. <laughs> not allowed to be flipping snowing. Just finished watching *Throne of the Opera* for the third time since it became available last night. Wait. Yeah, um, the I believe it's the 25th anniversary concert Ooh. is available for free on YouTube. Is that one of the ones you like or one of the ones you hate? Um, it's. <laughs> I know. Are we talking about *Phantom* or are we talking about that specific iteration of *Phantom*? I'm talking about any given *Phantom* version because I know they're all polarizing. <laughs> is what I know about. <laughs> so. I love Phantom of the Opera. It, it was the very first show that I ever saw. Um, I was like eight years old and I got to stay up past my bedtime. You know, it was, I live like an hour outside of New York City. I'll be back. I need to get the iron to drink. <laughs> um, so, you know, I got to stay up until like, you know, we got home around midnight. Um, it's one of those shows. It came out around the year I was born. Um, along with Les Mis, and of course, were, both of them were hugely popular. And so I actually grew up literally listening to both of those contracts. So uh, it, it has a very special place in my heart. It's one of the shows that I've seen the most. I think I've seen it four times. So I saw it once with you. That was the first show that we saw together. Was it? Yeah. Was that the one that your dad took us to? No, that was Les Mis. That was Limis, you're right. Um, when we were still dating, yeah. before we were living together, you, me, and your older sister, oldest younger sister, yes. Eve, went to see Phantom together. That's right. My sister was in town, and I was like, let's go to Broadway. And she yeah. was also and, like, yeah. let's go to Broadway. Yeah, Phantom is one of those shows that you can get tickets to whenever. Same and day. especially now, you can get discounted tickets because it's been running forever. Well, not now, but, you know, well, generally yeah. now. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, it was the very first show that I saw, um, I, and I saw it once again in elementary school with a friend, and I saw it once in high school with a different friend, and then the last time I saw it was with you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I love it. it. It's one of those shows that, like, you see it so many times and you love it so much that you get opinions about different productions. <laughs> um, I'm not a fan of the movie. <laughs> which which movie? I know there are a few. Um, well, the, the movie of the musical, the okay. movie adaptation of the Andrew Lloyd Webber musical okay. is not the best. I We were going to watch it at some point, me and Eli. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not terrible. It's just nobody can really sing. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Or like they can sing, but they can't sing that style. <laughs> it's specific. Like, it's very like the Minnie Driver is a very good singer, mm. but she doesn't actually sing over the course of the show. She plays Carlotta. <laughs> Ah, okay. She so when she sang the closing credit song, you know the 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 new song that they wrote in order to be uh, considered for an Oscar. Obligatory, yeah. Um, and it's a, it's a fine song, but she doesn't sing as Carlotta. She was dubbed over by an actual opera singer. Okay. Which is just weird. That is that is weird. Like what? When did it come out? It was like two thousand two or something? Two thousand seven, maybe. I'll have to take your word on that one. By the way, chat, let me know if audio is weird because I'm steaming ironing. Uh, F. Mim says, hello, it looks like one of you dyed your hair blue and maybe my computer reception. No, it's blue. It's blue. Realize hair is blue. Uh, yep. Hair color looks cool. Thanks. Um, mine is just gray. <laughs> <laughs> it's dyed gray, but uh, Mini Driver is the best part of that whole movie. I agree. <laughs> I mean, Rawl, I think Rawl was the most uh, suited to the role. And like as far as both uh, talent and ability to play the part, <laughs> um, and I did see him later. Uh, he was doing barefoot in the park on Broadway. I saw it with my acting class and uh, with Middlesex County College, <clears throat> and he was fine in that. I just I get kind He's of bored fine. with stage plays. Just. <laughs> I, I, I like it when people break out into song. <laughs> totally. So, the 25th anniversary concert. Yeah. Oh, I, I've been trying to sing along, Oops. and it's so hard. The singers in the 25th anniversary are such a major reach. Yeah, that's, it's a very difficult show. I'm not, I, I like, I, I have no, uh, it's a very hard show. <laughs> like, for every single part. Like, especially, especially the Phantom and Christine and Carlotta. Like the the range necessary to play those roles is ridiculous. Um, I thought for a second there you were gonna say I can't do that, and I was about to remind you of that time you did that at a house. Sometimes party. I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard. Um, but so the twenty fifth anniversary concert. So the twenty fifth anniversary concert is the reason that I know who Sierra Bojes is. I don't know if I'm saying that her last name right. Um, I had seen her in another show before. Uh, it was uh, the Little Mermaid musical back when that was on Broadway for like a year, <laughs> um, which it was fun. It was fine. It wasn't uh, as good as it should have been. The only thing I know about it is that they had tails and they were on skates, which I like. As yeah, they were on uh, they were on heelys, so they could walk and also just randomly glide across the stage. Mermaids on Heelys. I'm into it. Um, that was also the 25th anniversary concert for Les Mis. The guy who played Javert, he played Triton, and he was very good. Um, like I said, all of the actors were very good. Uh, the kid who played Flounder was amazing. Um, but Sierra Bogus, she played Ariel, and it's not that she can't sing. Obviously, she can sing. She's an amazing singer. My issue with Sierra Bojas, and I know other people have pointed this out, is she pronounces her vowels very weird sometimes. 
And like normally when I go see a show, if I don't know the actor ahead of time, then I don't remember their names after the fact. But I remembered her because I watched the 25th uh, Phantom concert uh, after I had seen Little Mermaid. And um, as she was singing, uh, probably uh, Think of Me, I like had this very familiar moment of why did she pronounce that word that way? And so I had to, you know, I looked her up and it was Ariel. I wish, <laughs> Emily's asking for an example, and I wish I could, like, it goes completely out of my head, like, as soon as the song finishes, and I can't, like, I know she does it a couple of times during that concert. Um, she did it a lot more during Little Mermaid, mm. um, and it's, like, not, it's not consistent or anything. So it's not, like, an accent? No, it's definitely not an accent. Okay. And, like, I... I have this theory. I think it might be uh-huh. a vocal coach, uh. a particular professional vocal coach, because I heard it somewhere else. Okay. We saw the Newsies Broadway production. Again, another very short run. Um, it was a fine show. It was fun. It wasn't as good as it could have been. Um, yeah, we did see that together, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. Newsies, was, Newsies would have been better okay. if they at least hadn't done a reprise of carrying the banner every single time there was a set change. Like eight times, one one song. <laughs> um, but so uh, they so they rearranged some of the songs for that sh- for the Broadway production of Newsies. So they opened with. Uh, Jack singing Santa Fe and I had a, another moment where I was yeah. like I was just yeah. thrust out of like just listening to the song with this why did he pronounce that word that way yeah and I don't it, remember specific words either but I also right? remember just being like unsettled <laughs> by the way that song was performed because I had to like pause in my head while he was still singing and replay a couple of words in my head to like go through the auditory processing of what what exactly was that supposed to oh yeah yeah it's just like a word like, jumble in, in yeah, it's audio just form weird and so i i highly suspect that this is a vocal coach thing yeah um because you know a lot of a lot of broadway actors go to you know regular vocal lessons just to hone the skill I'm making you into the Phantom by Steven. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good. Also, yes to Meg Christine. Meg Christine is the correct ship. Bar none, except perhaps any threesome with Christine and Raul. I think Christine and Raul should open it up. <laughs> Newsies used to be on Netflix. We did see never got the, a chance to fully watch it and get into it. And I'm very excited about it. Was it the was it the musical or was it just the movie? The movie with Christian with baby Christian Bale. Baby little Christian Bale. Yeah. Which you know that's that's another thing. I had a bit of a problem with the, the Broadway production. Like part of the charm of Jack, and especially the number Santa Fe, like part of the charm of that was that Christian Bale can't sing. <laughs> like he did his best. And it was like just it was very it was well and not well intentioned it was pure yeah yeah it was it was like this is this is a kid who can't sing who is still pouring all his heart out into this piece of music and it was fine and yeah, yeah i i don't mind uh unlike you i don't mind that the the lead in the musical newsies could in fact sing but i just wish that they had then like given him more to do well, like then repeat the same reprise attempts with the chorus and otherwise then no like around. my my issue with the way that they handled Santa Fe is mm. just that I don't think they had a very good director like a good director like it wouldn't have mattered that he is a very good singer um but it ended up being very like fear camp you know, this is a, clearly a very talented young man, and he wants to show off. And there's nothing wrong with that. 
But this is a song about an orphan who is basically trying to convince himself that his parents are just waiting for him out west. And if he just raises enough money and gets his ass out there, then he'll make it. And like, you just, you need to focus a little bit more on the emotion rather than... This kid can sing. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, you know, it's something that's really hard when you're like in your early 20s and you're really talented. Yeah. And like, that's true for a bunch of younger well i think the younger actors that i've seen on broadway like the the most memorable ones have been the ones that put so much emotion into their voices versus the ones who are technically very good right i feel like matilda for example was technically quite good mm -hmm. but matilda the matilda who we saw uh this kid who was like hit all the notes did everything was great did not leave as much of an impression on me as uh the kid who's uh baby allison in the fun home soundtrack because mm. the kids who act in fun home are putting their hearts in there <laughs> and like you know again this is a director problem like it's the director's job to to figure out how to bring that out yeah like what do i need to tell this person in order to get across exactly what they should be feeling here God, Matilda. Ow. I really are you okay? Yes, I just, right. I, this side. I just stabbed myself, it's fine, is, is <laughs> like the most classic hitting and hitting phrase in the world. Um yeah. Matilda was another one that we got to see on Broadway. I forget whether we went to the lottery or whether we just bought tickets. No, I, I bought tickets to it. That's right. And I was really excited for it because I was a really big rolled doll fan when I was a kid before I learned exactly how anti-semitic he is and you know i still like some of his stuff and matilda was one of those like matilda the movie is a, a beautiful and flawless piece of media um matilda the musical is bad <laughs> problematic in a lot of ways mean-spirited towards precisely the sets not precisely but many of the sets of people that it's supposed to be sympathetic towards yeah. and also incidentally mean-spirited like sites at people who uh like the trans community who did not the i will say the trench bull is played by a dude and it's a it's a ha ha dude in a dress role now yeah. and which also incidentally completely takes away any of the uh the menacing yeah the, the menace of her character <laughs> yeah yeah turning the trench bolt into a camp drag comedy role was poor form just poor thinking poor decision making all around also it focuses so much on the parents yeah it focuses so much on like miss honey like the entire show is basically a means for Miss Honey to get over her childhood trauma yeah. as opposed to like the movie where she uses her childhood experiences to help Matilda out of her really horrible situation. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. <laughs> there are also some weird staging choices. Like Which ones? they well they I, I remember talking about it um after we got out. Oh. After we got out of the show, like they they had a lot of uh, entrances uh, that came in through the audience, but they oh, yeah. used them in like really inconsistent ways. It was almost like they were just, they had people coming in through the audience because there was a traffic jam backstage. <laughs> you gotta like, you gotta use that device for a purpose, like to immerse the audience or to startle people from a direction or something. You can't just do it just for fun. Yeah, like there was a, the, so the two examples I can think of, mm. um, Miss Honey comes in through the audience during the big When I Grow Up scene number, um, which was cute at the time, just because there was a little kid in the aisle who was dancing around and sort of blocking her, <laughs> <laughs> blocking her ability to get up onto the stage. And, you know, she was sort of like, you know, trying to negotiate with the kid along with the parents. Kids shows. Yeah. Um, 
so yeah, she came up onto the stage through the audience at that point. And it was like, it was fine. It didn't add anything to the story and take anything away. But then they had this whole sequence where they revealed uh, that the trench bowl was this Olympic, uh, oh yeah, the uh, Olympic gold medalist, and um, may or may not have killed her her brother. Uh, oh, Matilda was like Definitely telling killed her brother. Yeah, yeah. Matilda was telling this story um, throughout the course of the show that was fictional, but turned out to act, this was like the big reveal that it was actually about um, Miss Honey's parents and the trench bowl. And that could have been a really great moment to have the Trunchbull enter from the back of the theater and like slowly make her way onto the stage. Because Matilda's telling this story to the audience. Yeah. Like that is ostensibly the, to the audience. Right. Like that is that is sort of the, the moment that we get as as like a uh I don't want to say immersive because the whole show is immersive. It's a show. But like that's that's the moment of sort of direct audience interaction, aside from the really crappy bits. But yeah, they just had her enter on the stage. It's like, well, you could have, if you were going to use that as a thing to have people enter from the audience, that could have been a really could have been menacing, a like power <laughs> move. <laughs> but they didn't. <laughs> I'm glad we got to see it though, just because otherwise I would have always wondered, was it really that bad? <laughs> like, because well, the soundtrack is good, except soundtrack. for the the TV number. Yeah, <laughs> soundtrack's decent. Um, but yeah, it was also that was a formative uh, influence on me as a kid. Uh, Mara Wilson is the best forever. <laughs> we got to meet Mara Wilson once. I got to buy her a drink. Sure. She's cool. <sighs> you know, talking about Broadway doesn't quite make me miss New York, but it does make me miss being close to Broadway. Yeah, I, I grew up close to Broadway. I've seen a, a ton of shows. <laughs> my my family was big on Broadway. My mom used to get together groups with uh, one of the places that she worked. And because you could get, you can get uh, discounted tickets if you bring in a certain number of people. Um, we used to do that all the time. It's very far away now. We entered the Hamilton lottery like 18 times, never got <laughs> it. But, but we did get the Wicked lottery the first time we tried. And that yeah. was amazing. We were the first ones picked for the Wicked lottery that night. Well, you were. We yeah. both put our names in. Yeah, I think, you know. Yeah, that which was is... the very first time that either of us had done the lottery. Which is kind of like typical luck on, on my mom's side of the family. So it was just delightful to have it work at that moment that we got to go see Wicked. And because we were the first ones called in the lottery, we got to be in the front row. Well, I think all the tickets were for the front row. Yeah, but we got to pick where we were. <laughs> and God, it was, it was so good. We got to see the stitching on the costumes like we were that close what are you looking at uh chat in yeah. general kids appreciate theater so much better than we do it's true <laughs> one of the nice things about the newsy musical was uh just being um in front of a bunch of kids. And I mean, yes, they talked and, and fidgeted and whatever, but also it's nice to be like in a theater with a bunch of kids really enjoying the show. Oh, yeah, no, I think we're, we, I'm pretty sure we were there with like a whole bunch of British field trippers. Yeah. Like who were there to see their friends. Yeah. And it was adorable. That was adorable. Of course, we were like Shit. the lone. 30 year olds in a theater full of children and their adult chat room, <laughs> which is a little weird. Uh, it's Broadway. It's fine. We were there to see a show. Oh, your dad's here. Hey, hey, dad. He says, How did you look? <clears throat> oh, Negev says, Their mother went to New York for 
a week a few years ago and won the Hamilton lottery. Nice. She, she doesn't even like musicals, and I'm so bitter. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> so dad's here, so I'm gonna call him out for a second. And just to say that he uh call him out is not the right word. He uh <laughs> got tickets for my littlest sibling to see Lynn Manuel Miranda's oh, final performance on Broadway of Hamilton. And I was just ah uh, <laughs> Ah, oh, I wanted to see that so bad. And also, wow. And you know, one of these days we will. We'll yeah. get there and we'll see it. Or we'll get to Boston or we'll do it in Minneapolis or it's all over now. Yeah. And one of these days we'll even perform a musical again. <laughs> Probably not Hamilton. It's very difficult oh, no. to collect the cast for that in this area. <laughs> so little difficult. What was the first show you ever actually saw? Ooh. Like professional production. Professional. The first professional production that I actually saw. Um, I moved to New York in 2010, and I was uh, attempting weird jobs. Like I got a, a retail gig in a stationery store around the corner from Carnegie Hall, midtown touristy job. And then I... Uh, quit that so I could be a camp counselor for Japanese ballerinas in central Connecticut, which was like a three week gig, which was wonderful, but also exhausting because we were, I was literally on for God, 12, 14 hours a day, uh, interpreting for these 10 ballerinas at ballet camp. Um, sometimes there was a chain of interpreters because uh, the Russian ballet teachers would speak in Russian and they'd have an interpreter to English. And then I would chain from English to Japanese for the Japanese contingent. And the field trip on week two of that three week thing was we're all gonna go to Broadway and we're gonna see West Side Story. And the West Side Story production that we saw- uh, It was the one produced by Miranda. No. Yeah. Really? I don't. Well, I don't know if it was produced oh. or directed, but yeah, this is we're, we're in like 2010. He was not in it, but it was him. Huh? He had. He's been doing shows yeah. for much longer than what that story was. Huh? I mean, yeah, he did in the Heights in what 06. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, anyways, we went to see West Side Story in I want to say these. This was the summer of 2010. Yeah. That makes sense. That tracks. And um, it was the production that was partly in Spanish. Which again, interpretation chain, except from this time, I didn't have anybody who spoke Spanish. I was just using my kid who grew up in Texas scraps of Spanish plus context plus what I knew about West Side Story to interpret in whispers for the Japanese ballerinas next to me, like, what are they saying? What's Which going on? You hadn't seen it before, right? I Which saw the movie. Part of, oh, okay. I had seen the movie, but I had not, in fact, seen like the rest of it. I'll say your dad has seen it. Oh, good. What's he say? Uh, Emma wrote a letter afterward, Emma being the youngest yes. sister who got to see the yeah, final right. performance, uh, wrote a letter afterward to Miranda and got a handwritten reply. God damn. <laughs> hope she framed it. <laughs> uh, I hope uh, you're framing it. Oh, did we see the, they filmed the original Broadway cast of Hamilton Live, uh, set to release next year in October. Nice. Yes. I excited. Did, I did hear that. I, I heard a lot of people like begging them to release it a little bit earlier. <laughs> <laughs> given the givens, but if it's set to release next October, next October, it's probably not out of editing. Yeah. Oh. Well, it might also be a licensing thing. Yeah. Because licensing with Broadway is very so um, Byzantine and legal. <laughs> Hang on, let me let me finish oh, the yeah, story. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I, let's let's talk about licensing on Broadway, but let me finish the story first of me sitting in a Broadway theater for my first Broadway show that I had ever seen at all, trying to absorb the musicalness of it, but also trying to remember my Spanish, what little scraps of Spanish I have, remember the vague plot of West Side Story based on uh, a half-remembered movie you'd seen once. A half-remembered movie I'd seen once, plus the plot of Romeo and Juliet, which I only <laughs> remembered from the Baz Luhrmann movie. <laughs> I mean, the Baz Luhrmann movie is the most accurate adaptation of Romeo and Juliet. It's true, which is good, because that's the one that I had available as I uh, frantically whispered in Japanese to a couple of, of like 12-year-old ballerinas leaning over next to me and one of them leaning over their friend to listen to me whisper in Japanese, like, 
what's going on right now? <laughs> and sure that was people around you love that. We were surrounded by all the other ballerinas who oh, were very good. used to me whispering in Japanese to keep their cohort up. Um, they they were all like really super patient with the kids who spoke zero English and yeah so that that on that count I felt okay but that was my first Broadway experience with as an interpreter <laughs> with very limited tools in my toolbox all right so licensing in Broadway oh, yeah. is a whole extra thing the only the only specific thing that I know um that is unusual about Broadway licensing which I didn't realize other people didn't know until I started talking to people who had grown up outside of New Jersey, if you're within a certain mileage, yeah. a, a, a mile circle of New York City, you are not allowed to perform a show that is currently running on Broadway um, in a even in a community theater setting. Which is wild, right? Because the, the theory goes that you are taking money away from that professional production and not Which, like you're drawing attention to them or yeah because you know people who want to see a professional broadway show are going to not spend the 60 dollars to see it at the time 60 dollars <laughs> um to go see a community theater production of it full of people that they may or may not know <laughs> I feel like the this is like more it's almost a more legitimate concern now that Broadway tickets are what between a hundred and four hundred dollars. That's fair. not like super legitimate because still you're going to pay the money if you really want to see the dang show. But but also like the licensing uh, to to perform it on other stages. Like there's a certain amount of time I think. Um, either from the time it opens or from the time it closes, where people usually release the rights to let other people perform it. Yeah. Um, so, like with a new musical, it's not an issue anyway because nobody can perform it. And with an older musical, well, people have probably already seen it anyway. <laughs> yeah. And like with Phantom, nobody's released the rights for that. <laughs> Yeah, so like nobody, high schoolers can't do Phantom in this right. area, right? Like ever. And it's silly. Yeah. But, oh wait, I put those backwards. I just got up and sat back down and didn't get water. No. Would you yeah. pour me a glass? Give me a second. Thanks. <laughs> to be fair, I doubt high schoolers would do Phantom well. I mean, true. <laughs> Yeah, but they want to. And that's the thing about what I feel strongly about like high school musical theater is that if they really, really want to do it and they think they can pull it off, they should get to try. Even if it sucks, they will learn so much. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing about high school performances is it's more about giving the kids experience than it is necessarily about putting on a Broadway quality show because that's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I'm thinking about it, and you know what the second musical perform musical performance I ever saw was? What? It was the Drowsy Chaperone, done by Middlesex Community College Players. Uh, that was not a professional production. Nobody got paid for that. Krista was in the chorus, and she was great, and it was great, and I loved it. And I came, and I saw it twice, and the second time, I made sure to place myself in the audience where she'd see me just doing the adoring eyes on the stage. And... <laughs> The Drowsy Chaperone was also like a really nice show to watch for me personally because it is about uh, fandom, it is about being a fan, and it is about specifically being a fan of musicals and musical culture, so it was a really good sort of meta introduction for those of us who did not grow up in the Broadway orbit. Uh, to uh, sit down and be like, ah, here is a fan who is really excited about musicals telling the audience about musicals. And it's like, okay, this is a good way to, to hop in is yes, title character, not title character, but main character, narrator of the Drowsy Chaperone, please tell me your special interest was, was great. The Drowsy Chaperone is also a very difficult show. <laughs> you see that, but y'all did it really well and NYT did it really well. So I've only ever seen good... <laughs> Good performances of it. I mean, 
but yeah, it's it's hard. Um, if it, mostly because of the weird. So the if you're not familiar with Jazzy Chaperone, uh, the conceit is that you are in the apartment of the narrator, and he is playing you the record of his favorite one of his favorite musicals, and so all of the actual music is being played through a record and everything that happens on stage is his imagination because this was a, a show that went up in i think he said the 30s 20s the 20 late 20s it has yeah. to be the late 20s because i didn't use i did a uh, makeup and hair yeah i was in charge of makeup and hair for that and i did a lot of research and i remember that yeah specifically like looking more at 30s than 20s makeup mm. um and like they go out of their way to remind you that it's a record. There's points, um, especially during finale numbers where the record skips or the it's big so finale number where the power goes out in his apartment building and it suddenly comes back on. So, and there's a whole scene, <laughs> not a whole scene, but uh, so the power goes out in the middle of, the last note. Yeah, between at the end of the the last uh, line of the of the song, um, right before the last note, right before the last note, and so everybody gets to stand there, just sort of droopy because the power went out, um, and the landlord comes up or the landlord's wife comes up and knocks on the door and explains what's going on and walks across the stage, you know, chatting about something or other, completely inconsequential, has nothing to do with anything going on, um, to, you know, messes around with the, the power box uh, to, I, I guess, see what was going on because the power doesn't come back on until she leaves. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, so they chat, chat, chat. And then he's like trying to get her out of the apartment because he wants to finish listening to the record. And he finally gets her out and the power comes back on and the performers have to come right back in with no lead in of any kind. On the most powerful note on, of the show. On that last, that final note, come back in with the orchestra, which was especially hard for us because the orchestra was in a pit underneath the stage and the only person who could see us was the conductor who had a little hole for his head so he could <laughs> he could conduct us with his head <laughs> and it was it was tricky <laughs> it was so good to watch as an audience member just the power comes back on and then you remember that we were in the last line because everybody is like bah all at once it was great it was so good uh, your dad says, Emma was the music director of You're in Town, mm. Red Dragon Player in Boston High School. Video recording is prohibited by something called the International Copyright Act. God. I, don't, I did You're in Town, too. I don't remember that. But also, I wasn't that interested in having a copy of it. You know, that was my, <laughs> it was my first big role. Isn't that You're the one town. Isn't that the one when you got the scar on your head? On your, on your shin? No, no, I have a, a I have a um Emily's asking if we see Holy Musical Batman. Not yet. Um it's on the list. I have a, a bump <laughs> in my shin, in my shin bone. Um that was in the, I got that in high school. Okay, so that was we a different did, one. um we did Pygmalion, which is the non-musical version of My Fair Lady. Like it's 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 the play that it's My Fair Lady play. was yeah. based on. Um and we had uh, period accurate costumes, so I was wearing like five skirts. And uh, hang on one moment, Remy's scratching at the thing that the microphone is on. So if you're wondering what that weird audio is, <laughs> our cat is wants attention. What? Yeah, come, come on, quit scratching at the microphone stand. <laughs> that doesn't make good audio. Um, Sorry. So the the way the theater was set up, and my our. Our uh, theater director in high school loved to cast as many people as he possibly could who showed up at auditions. Um, so the way he would handle that, because we had a relatively small theater, uh, was that 
most of the ensemble would be out in the audience. Um, and so most of our entrances and exits would be out the front door of the theater or the back door sometimes, um, the side doors regardless. Um, and the front door of the theater because fire codes in schools require a window to be on the door, but um, the, that door was right next to the front door. So it would let sunlight in and we weren't allowed to technically cover up the door. Um, so he handled that by putting up these black curtains around the little, there was like three concrete steps down to the door. <laughs> so he put uh, these curtains around the, uh, the little stairwell. And I, it was my sophomore year. So I really had no excuse to forget that there were stairs there. No, but there's a safe, <laughs> these are, this is a safety precaution for a reason. <laughs> the safety precaution was 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 circumvented, but that doesn't mean that it was unnecessary. Well, here's precisely the thing. because there was no reason why they needed to put stairs in to begin with. But um, there were stairs there, so it so, should have been lit. Well, no, it's not even that I forgot that they were there, but I had got I got tripped up in my like five skirts and the curtain um mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to go down. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And it ended up falling instead. And my shin hit the corner of one of those concrete steps. And now I have a, a dip in my shin. <laughs> my my leg did not break or anything. I, I didn't have to, like, That's there good. was no blood. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to go to the hospital. I just got a nasty bruise and a bump. <laughs> Theater injury stories are the best. And I say that I say that as a stage manager. Like I want to know all of the theater injury stories so that I, I can imagine like the ways to present to prevent them as many as possible. Okay, but you also, want you want an, an even worse, not even a theater injury story, just a, a terrible costuming story. Heck yeah. I I do much more crew than I do on stage, so costuming and stage managing is largely my jam in these things. I think I told you about this before. Fire away. So uh there the big theater company uh in my part of New Jersey was called is called Plays in the Park. And every December they put on Joseph and the Amazing Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat at the State Theater, which is kind of a big deal. Um, at least it was for us. Uh, they don't do it. They don't. They still do the show, but what they used to do was they had the uh, children's choir, which is technically supposed to be a part of the show. Like if they're they're sort of the, the Greek chorus. You know, they sing backup for everything going on on stage. Uh, I, I think a lot of production. It's not production... a great chorus. It's just a chorus. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the thing is, they're not a part of the show. Sure. They don't yeah. interact with anything going on except through song. Okay. Um, and I think a lot of productions don't necessarily do that anymore. Yeah. But so they were doing it uh, for a few years while I was in elementary school. And they... Uh, somebody, one of the kids' parents at my elementary school knew somebody who was involved in the production or something, I think. And so uh, they made a deal with my elementary school where uh, they would... We need a bunch of kids. You have a bunch of kids. Yeah. Can you loan us your bunch of kids for the yeah. show? So yeah. like anybody who was interested in being in the show and, you know, had the time to do rehearsals, I uh, could be part of the show. We didn't have to audition or anything um, because, you know, we're kids and we're not expected to be able to actually sing well. <laughs> um, and so our music teacher handled all of the rehearsals um, except for uh, right up until like the, there were a couple of tech rehearsals that we went to um, for the very minimal on stage blocking that we had, which was go basically- Go here, then go there, well, then leave. Yeah, exactly. We, we walked out onto the stage from the wings um, in two different groups. We were split up into two different parts anyway. Um, <clears throat> so we'd walk onto the stage from the wings walk up onto the uh, big tri 
staircase that was the main set piece, the only real set piece. Um, and we sit around Joseph and sing through um, the first iteration of Any Dream Will Do. And then uh, during the incidental music that led into the actual show, we walked down from the stairs and into these little risers at the front of the stairs, at the front of the stage. And that's where we stayed until intermission. Yeah. And then we left and then we came right back to this, <laughs> the risers after this is, intermission. This is and we kid, stayed there until the end of the show. This is a kid's choir concert. Right. Yeah, we exactly. The we, yeah. we had some like dance moves that we had to do, but those were all taught to us in the rehearsal at school by our music teacher. It's a great music teacher curriculum. Right? Yeah. Um, so when I first started doing it, you were only allowed to do it six seventh and eighth grade um, because those were the only kids that they trusted <laughs> to have, you know, the sense of responsibility that they could just throw them onto stage and they would do what they were told. Mm -hmm. So um, the first year that I did it, uh, was I think the second year, the second or third year uh, that they were involved. Um, the costume, such as it was, was just a pair of jeans sure. and a t-shirt with the logo. Um, okay. Again, which, it's a choir concert. Yeah. 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 Um, which was fine. No, we weren't, again, we were not supposed to be a part of the show. Right. The second and third year, uh -huh. and also the fourth year, I, my fourth year was incongruous. Um, they needed more people, and so... Emergency call. For yeah, a, exactly. For a, for a freshman. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I was, a, I was a sophomore. Okay. Um, yeah. But my little brother was in eighth grade, and so he was doing it. Yeah. And so they got to call me back. Um, they still wanted us to be wearing jeans and a t-shirt, uh, but underneath these coral robes. Okay. Um, because they wanted us to look like a choir, okay. which is fine. But the problem was that they were using coral robes that they already had in their costume closet. Uh -huh. Because, I mean, you know, it's a community Budget. theater production. Sure, you sure. save money wherever you can. They were adult-sized choir robes. Did you all trip on the risers all the we, way up and down? We were, what is, six to eighth grade. That's yeah. like yeah. 10 to 12-year-olds yeah. wearing adult-sized choir robes. You were all just swimming in tents all the way up and down and across the stage. Like, even with that minimal blocking, how many people ate it? <laughs> like, like here's the, nobody fell. Great. Good the, job, the kids. The main, the main uh, challenge. <laughs> victims of this costume uh -huh. choice were people's faces uh -huh. because... Wait, were they some, hooded? No, 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 no. They just had big bell sleeves. And oh. at some point, um, during Go, 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 Joseph, right. during that number, we were all supposed to stand up uh, during the, uh, you know, when the music drops out and everybody's clapping, we were supposed to stand up and clap with our hands in the air. And we we're all like <laughs> right on top of each other. And we have these big bell Smack. sleeves just smacking each other in the face. Did um, anybody lose their glasses? Probably. That would have happened. I didn't have glasses at the time. I w absolutely would have been that kid who lost the class. So the other victim in, during, because of this decision, were the robes themselves. Because the uh -huh. risers, right, first of all, the risers were like maybe six inches tall, which, you know, was kind of a pain already, but we were all relatively, you know, we weren't adult-sized. Yeah. So it wasn't as big of a deal as it would be, like, say, right now. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> because we were instructed to walk straight down from the steps, get down to the risers, and sit down without any fuss whatsoever, <laughs> most of us ended up sitting down with our feet 
on top of the hems of the robes. Oh, to be the laundry per laundry person for that costume department. Oh, oh, and the shoe prints. It, it's not just the shoe prints. We were, again, instructed when we stood up to start doing the clapping, we had oh. to just do so in one movement. No fussing around. A chorus of rips. Yeah. <laughs> just... I, I just heard in my soul like a chorus of ripped vinyl. I'm mm -hmm. assuming vinyl. Or no. poly, polyester or whatever. Yeah, polyester. Yes. They yes. Were, I mean, they were real choir robes. Okay. Oh, that were being the operative word. Yeah. And I think most of the choir robes were held together on their hems with duct tape by the end of that very first year. So, and all of us complained about it. And they just kept, our music teacher just kept telling us, well, don't stand on the on the hems. You have to get the hems out of the way. Like you told us not to move. You told us to just get there and sit down. So you're saying that the first <laughs> note of that number was this. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it was like halfway through the song. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, it was oh. so bad. What's in chat? Um, I don't know. I have to refresh. Okay. Anyway, I ended up wearing those one of those ro robes again. Um, the one of plays in the part, one of the the guys who actually played one of the brothers in Joseph. Like they had basically the same exact cast every year. Um, he ended up directing a show, Tommy the Musical, uh, at the county college that I did a lot of shows at and technically attended. <laughs> um, and we use those robes for uh, one of the numbers. There's like a, there's a, a gospel number in that show. And um, me and one of the other cast members were in Joseph. <laughs> so the two of us were just like, cracking up the whole time and the robe that ended up fitting me best was actually the one that my little brother wore in Joseph <laughs> because his name was still sharpied on the collar like you do I did costuming for a couple years for Shakespeare in the Park here in Brattleboro and uh, one of the things about that <laughs> was that I, I got really uh, I started to have really strong opinions about how ways to um, connect people to their costumes in like ways that were not sharpie mm -hmm. <laughs> and also ways to keep costumes clean, which when we did the Tempest, it was 98 degrees in the shade and wet. It was just so hot all over the place. And of course the director wanted full on Elizabethan doublets and pantaloons and which look great <laughs> double skirts and a couple of corsets like the whole night during july and august when it was 98 degrees and, during and a heat wave during a heat wave everyone was sweating straight through their triple layers of wool so what i did as the costumer was like okay i made two rules one of them is that chuck as many costume pieces as you can or need to in between scenes and two i'm laundering everything every night no matter what <laughs> you don't have to wear your own sweat tomorrow because there was yeah i just did a lot of laundry that weekend yeah it felt important to me as the person making the costumes that people were not miserable wearing the costume That might be a guiding philosophy, I think. <laughs> like, don't be miserable wearing the things that you have to wear for the thing that you're doing. Or at least as little misery as possible. Yeah, minimize minimize the misery, given the given the givens of whatever situation we happen to be in. They say stringing along cloth masks and cute patterns. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of cute patterns. Check this out. There's like a tiny bit of it that was gifted to me by a friend in the general mask making community. So now I get to have a sewing machine mask and I am very happy to have that. So yeah, my next like fun one is gonna have sewing machines on it. And I think maybe a little bit more embroidery because I started to do embroidery on a mask and really had a lot of fun with it. And my next embroidery is a hummingbird on a mask for Krista. And then after that, I'm going to do something 
maybe a decorative border around one of these. Your dad says, wow, that is self-referential, a mask maker's mask. Yes. <laughs> a mask maker's mask with prints of sewing machines on it. It's just the thing. <sighs> Speaking of mask makers and their masks, um, I'll get back to theater in a minute. But <laughs> on Monday of this past week, a really brilliant small manufacturer called the Fashion Incubator dropped a bunch of videos on how to speed up mask making processes. Mm. And I uh, looked at them on on Tuesday and then immediately started to implement some ideas and then uh, ordered a piece of equipment that's here now. And it's just going to speed us up a lot, especially the step of putting bias tape on things. It's going to go faster now. And one of the one of the videos was uh, these things which I've been ironing, which are pleating forms, which Krista doesn't use, but I use sometimes, and which are quite helpful for folks who uh, are not used to pleating, because you just sandwich the flat mask between the two forms, and then you fold it, and then it's pleated in a way that a sewing machine can handle very quickly. And I'm still like figuring out how specifically I'm going to use that, but I think it's neat. So I wanted to show you. <laughs> Here's the thing that you can do with poster board. We've got oak tags <laughs> that, and it just auto pleats. Nega says they're currently sewing a mask by hand. Wait. I wish they had a sewing machine. Um, ask your local quilting group wherever you are, because I know our quilting group like loaned out sewing machines to people. That's true. Yeah. Like this is this one may be on loan very close to you. It's, it was also very nice. The um, I mentioned the theater where we saw Drowsy Chaperone for the second time. Uh, NEYT, the New England Youth Theater, which is in downtown Brattleboro. Their costumer uh, is lent, lent out a couple of sewing machines to mask makers. It was really nice, and they also just passed me a whole bunch of bias tape before we got the bias tape maker, and that was lovely of them. NEYT is pretty cool. It's a, a youth theater that does some really interesting productions and chooses fun things. The last thing I saw there was called Too Much Light Makes the Baby Go Blind, which is not a musical mostly. It's, uh, <laughs> it's partially improv and partially meta theater, I guess. It's from the neo-futurist theater uh, they're the ones who developed it in Brooklyn, and I got to see them do that in Brooklyn in 2011, and then I got to see it again done by teenagers in Brattleboro in 2019. God, it was good. Um, how to explain too much light makes the baby go blind. There are 30 plays. Each of them lasts between one and two minutes. Are they plays or are they just scenes? Some of them are just scenes. Some of them are multiple I think they're mostly just scenes, mm -hmm. but they're self-contained and they call them plays. Okay. Yeah, they call them plays. I'm not, I'm not sure how they justify that, but they do. And each of them is, anyway, each of them is between one and two minutes. Uh, they're numbered and they are named in the program that everyone has. And when they finish with one play or at the start of the show, they ask the audience to shout a number and whatever number someone hears they grab the number and start the play. So you have 30 possible things that you might be doing in the next two minutes on stage. And depending on what the audience shouts and what, what's going on, uh, you might be doing any of them. And the objective of Too Much Light is to get <coughs> all of them done in uh, two hours, mm -hmm. I think. The, the numbers are displayed on the stage in some form? Yes, they are on a close layer in large form sharpie on a clothesline. So uh, at the start of one, uh, a cast member hears 19 and they run and grab the 19 and yank it off and crumple it up and throw it into the audience. Uh, Negev is asking if the Night Vale people are neo-futurists. I believe that. I know they're affiliated. 
with that theater. I know that, uh, yeah, I, I have, I think uh, Joseph Fink did some stuff with the Neo Futures Theater because they're a specific improv group in uh -huh. Brooklyn. And I, I, I know also that they're, uh, they've got similar working vibes. styles. Yeah, vibes. Yeah, they've got very similar vibes. Sounds pretty difficult for the actors. Yeah, I haven't I haven't seen it personally, but every uh, Eli has described it to me both times that they saw it, and yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to have all. I mean, not all of the actors are in all of the plays. Uh, the production at NYT had a cast of I think uh, fifteen or sixteen, and every play had maybe between two and twelve people in it. <laughs> And so uh, sometimes audience members, sometimes and sometimes audience members. So uh, it was also like a question of who was going to be acting at any given moment. And ev every time uh, there was the time for the audience to shout out a number, all you could see the whole cast like sit forward in their seats, like, "Am I up? Am I up?" And there was a couple of sh a couple of plays that called for the whole company. That when uh, that number was called everyone jumped, all of the whole cast jumped up from their seats and rearranged the stage and it was like, all right, here we go. We're all in a restaurant together now. <laughs> it was extremely good. I, uh, I caught a memento from that show because they take the, the number of the play and they crumple it up and they throw it into the audience. I caught one and they had the name of the play on the back of the number. And I think the one that I got was uncensored lesbian fight scene. Yes. Which, uh, Uncensored lesbian fight scene is uh, a scene in which um, there's there's four players and two of them are revving up to fight and they're they're like in boxing corners and they've got a ref behind them going okay okay you can do this you can do this you're, you're, go get her go get her and then they step up to each other and they're like I just really feel that my feelings haven't been respected and they go into like seamlessly into a couples therapy session. It's extremely good. <laughs> uh, that's the other thing about Too Much Light is that there were a number of moments where, it, especially in like the original time I saw it in Brooklyn, where I like braced, like, are they going to be gross in this moment? Uh -huh. No, they were never gross. They were always cool. Every time they were cool. There were so many good ones. And every the other thing about that is every time I think about that show and remember the show, I remember a different two-minute play. <laughs> like, I will sometimes think back on it and go, oh, yeah, there was that one where everybody stood together and chanted out uh, uh, in, in absolute robotic deadpan the monologue about improvising. <laughs> um, there was the one called Cyrano in which two people went into the audience and picked out audience volunteers and whispered to them what to say so that the audience, two volu audience volunteers were actually uh, performing the, the, the dialogue across the, across the theater with each other as they were getting lines fed to them by the actors. I liked that one. <laughs> it was pretty hilarious. And because that was a love scene, it could have been really gross depending on who they chose for audience members and how they chose to do it, but it wasn't. Again, because they, they thought about what they were doing, chose carefully, and had fun with it. And, yeah. yeah. And also, like, it was very consent-based. Uh, at the start, in the introduction, uh, they tell audience members, hey, there is audience participation here. If you are not into that, here is the hand signal to make when people go into audiences looking for volunteers. You make this hand signal, no one will pick you. It's fine. Well, like, having a, a consent-based model straight out the gate was relaxing. Uh, your dad asked, did you say that was Cyrano or did I miss Cyrano? No, you heard right. Yeah, <laughs> it was called Cyrano and it was a scene in which two people, two audience members were fed lines by two actors. A love scene. Or a meet cute scene, I should say. A scene in which two people meet and then decide to go on a date. The Bergerac? Yes. That, yeah, that's the reference. <laughs> yeah, that's the reference. 
I'm just clipping threads now because that's what I These just need to be clipped and turned around to be yeah. top stitch. Yeah, I will turn them next. I'm just doing things in very small steps sometimes because okay. that sometimes that helps me process is if I am doing like one tiny step a hundred times and then I can do the next tiny step a hundred times. Sometimes that feels better. And I'm just going with that these days. You know, it's whatever whatever feels okay <laughs> to do. And now your dad's speaking French. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Dad's dad's gone French in chat. That's I, I would read it out, but my accent is terrible. <laughs> I didn't take French, I took Italian. <laughs> read it in an Italian accent. No. Aw. <laughs> I bet speaking French in an Italian accent is the sort of thing that French people I, really hate. I don't think it's possible. <laughs> I'm sure it's possible. You can always have a specific foreign accent. He's reciting his favorite lines. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, no, too much French ends in consonants, and Italian doesn't do that. <laughs> uh, well, in that case, the way to uh, speak French with an Italian accent is to drop a bunch of ending consonants, right? Which, doesn't French, like, I mean... French spells things with consonants, but well, does, does, does it always pronounce those? <laughs> That's fair, but I don't know the rules about which consonants are pronounced and which ones aren't. Yeah, so... Like, I assume I know, and then I hear somebody say that word, and it's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but no, the way that the Italians handle that mm -hmm. is similar to the way that Japan handles that, is to just have that little ending vowel to add a little ending vowel sound to the end of it. Mm -hmm. Grace noted, yeah. I say that like that's a approved linguistic term. I don't really know what the approved <laughs> linguistic term for that is, but I know what you mean. Well it's like it's sunny. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, you said you were going to bait me about something. Haven't I in the Facebook posts. <laughs> I thought I started by baiting you about Phantom performances. <laughs> but I like Phantom. <laughs> yes, which is exactly why you have strong opinions on the way certain words should be pronounced. <laughs> in the 20th anniversary concert version. 25th anniversary concert. That's what I said, I think. It's the 25th annual... Putnam County Spelling Bee. So the first musical that we did together, <laughs> and to date, only musical that we've done together, though yeah. someday another, was the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee. I think we did actually talk about this. Did we? Yeah, yeah. we talked about it in another stream. Yeah. God, it was good, though. It was good. I had so much fun. I had so much fun. Dad, I was playing you. I think I told you this, that I was playing. <laughs> I, I think I told the whole world that I was playing Dad. Uh, in my role on stage as a, a stern, disaffected academic uh, whose real job was to um, was was to let everyone else know uh, that they were just not quite smart enough. <laughs> I had a really good time with that. I also had a really good time just acting with those kids. There was uh, a lot of the people in that show were high schoolers. Yeah. And because were... the director, um, who for a very, very long time was the president of the local, one of the local community theater groups, um, which was the group that put on that show. Um, uh, and he, sorry, he <laughs> is, was the theater teacher. No, I think he teacher. actually teach, teaches English. Theater. Drama. Well, I, regardless, he also teaches, he also directs all of the shows at the high school. Yeah. Directed. He, he retired last year. <laughs> so everything's in the past tense. But yeah, no. Uh, Bob or, I think he great, retired this year. Yeah. Bob was a great director. And uh, and so he knew all the kid, the, all the high school kids, like basically in his class, yeah. who would be good for this and got them in on it. And uh, there was a point where he directed me to like be meaner to the kids, <laughs> which was a really interesting direction to take from a guy who is the drama teacher of these kids. But he, he, he did so, he directed this 
And the kid who I was supposed to be meaner to, she immediately like gave me the most dismayed, wide-eyed, lip-trembling, sobbing look. And I had to like look away and crack up. And I heard everyone else cracking up. And it's like, okay, okay, I can be meaner because you're obviously having fun with this. Yeah, and like this was the scene where that character was supposed to just break down into tears in the middle of the the, the spelling game. Because I snapped at her. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, you have more than one local community theater group. So the thing about Vermont is that it is such a small state, and there are so few people uh, living here that local can mean anything from your town to the surrounding five towns to that city three hours away. <laughs> yeah. So we have one, I think it's fair to say we have one community theater group in town. Um, yeah, maybe. No, because there's Shoot the Moon. Yeah, Shoot the Moon. Okay, so we have maybe two community theater groups in town. Maybe. Um, there might be another. That I'm but yeah, there's also uh, at least one uh, in the town in New Hampshire across the river. Um, More than one, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's one like an hour or so north of us that there is some crossover between regular auditioners. Yeah, the one <clears throat> north of us is the one that does the big musicals. They do things like Chicago and yeah. Jesus Christ Superstar. And if you want to do a big musical, you go up to Bella's Falls. That's Main Street Arts? Main Street Arts, yeah. yeah. But like Vermont Theater Company uh, down here in Brattleboro is where you go for Shakespeare in the Park and the occasional musical and some murder mystery stuff. And then you go to shoot the moon, I think, if you want to act in, like, weird plays, unusual drama, modern art drama, Yeah, I think they, is what they do. They did a bunch of cool Halloween stuff a yeah. few years ago. I think they did, like, stagings of uh, Poe stories Ooh. at some point. That's neat. Um, Forest of Mystery was going to do the Mask of the Red Death for for uh, the haunted Halloween thing a couple years back, and they then they changed it, and now I don't think they'll ever do it. <laughs> Somehow, I, I don't take the Mask of the Red Death, but also, like, maybe they should. <laughs> maybe the next time we all get together for a spooky theater thing, we should just do an adaptation of the Mask of the Red Death. So Forest of Mystery is also, it's not a group. Yeah. per se. It is a production that is put on by local theater people in conjunction with the Bonnyvale Environmental Education Center, otherwise known as The Beak. Um, the Beak is a, a mountain with hiking trails and some educational space buildings down at the bottom of it, and it's really cool. Yeah, they do lots of camps and they do uh, um, they do classes, mostly for like kids. Um, and they also do hikes. Uh, there was a full moon on New Year's yeah. a couple years ago, and they did a, a guided hike for that. Full moon New Year's, yeah. That but... we considered going to, and then we're like, do we really? It's snowing. It's It has it's snowed cold. so much. And, and it's on a dirt road, and we'll be able to leave <laughs> questions like that. Uh, they're, the person who runs the beak is notorious for having a squirrel in her pocket more often than not. Yeah. Um, She's so cool. The So Forest and Mystery happens usually the weekend before Halloween. Um, and it is what I've been calling a haunted hike. Other people have pointed out that that's not always entirely accurate because it's not necessarily supposed to be spooky. There's no jump scares. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, some there's there's no <laughs> there are jumps. It's not like it's not like walking through a haunted house. Yeah. Like nobody's going to jump out from behind a tree and scream at you with a bloody mask on. Um there have occasionally been uh bright lights and a ghost on a zip line that swoop past you in the woods. But only in service of the plot. Yeah. Um but yeah, that's what it, so they take you along. Uh, one of the the trails on the grounds um, and tell you a story and yeah and there is a coherent plot every year and it's always themed in some way and uh, the first 
year we did it was the men in black theme. There were aliens and it was fun. And the next year was the Scooby-Doo year where there was a spooky, uh, the Phantom of the Forest. Yes. A fake ghost. Bringing so, this back to Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> a fake ghost. So that uh, development would or would not happen or something. And then what was it this last year? Um, no, there was another year, um, which was the the sort of labyrinth. Oh, yeah. Uh, 80s Jim Henson inspired. God, I've been in four of these, and now I lost loose track. Um, yeah, the, the, the Jim Henson, the Muppets-ish one. Yeah, the, it was basically uh, the there was a village on the edge of the woods, because you walk through the woods, um, where sometimes there are children who don't, who stop aging and some of them will just, you know, they'll stop for a little while and they'll start aging again. And others will just stop altogether. And the ones who stop altogether are sent out and vanished into the woods where they become a part of nature. They become a tree or a, a, an animal or a star and it was super good. And then this past year was witches, yep. which was quite fun because it was witches through the ages and we got to be in the 1990s goth scene. So that was a delight. Um, I have not ever put on so much black eyeliner and I really enjoyed it. <laughs> and uh, we made purple and black striped leggings and I got to, I got to pull up my cloak, which I always like. <laughs> Any excuse to wear that black cloak. Yay. I forget what next year is supposed to be. They announced next year's theoretical theme yeah. um, during the cast show at the after the final performance. Yeah, I remember <clears throat> it was something I was excited about, but I don't remember what yeah. it was. Always assuming, of course, that we can gather at Halloween. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Tell you what, maybe next year we can do like a, a, a social distancing thing where everybody has masks and family groups go up and you're only interacting with the audience from six feet away. I mean, that, that's pretty true for the most yeah, part. Yeah, it, it wouldn't actually be that much of a stretch now that I think about it. <laughs> Apparently, Broadway costumers are all now, like, thoroughly engaged in sewing masks mm -hmm. across Manhattan. Oh, oh. Christian Siriano has been spearheading some efforts, and there have been other efforts just amongst the costume community. Uh -huh. Yeah, go ahead. I forgot. There's very important Broadway news Is that there? I just found out this morning, and I haven't told Eli about it. Okay. So, somebody is reviving 1776. Oh, God. Which okay. is that... <laughs> It's the one about John Hold Adams. your judgment. Yes, it's the one about John Adams. Okay. Um, it's, I never saw the stage production. I saw the movie. Um, I never really got super into it. Um, it just doesn't engage me that much. Um, the only really interesting thing about it that I find is that Adams is played by the guy who plays who played uh, Mr. Feeney in Black and Boy World. <laughs> but so they're reviving 1776, hoping to have it open uh, in spring of 2021 in, I believe, the roundabout year. Okay. The entire cast is female, non-binary, trans, and gender queer. And, and yeah. Was that an and yes. I heard? Yes. Um, and several of the actors who have been cast are also non white. Important. So, yeah. <laughs> cool. Cool. So, that's exciting. That might actually get me to watch 1776. <laughs> Uh, oh, your dad is running. He's, He's running off. Ah, uh, bye, dad. Bye. <sighs> okay. Okay. I can. Okay. <laughs>
I have a story about American history musicals on Broadway and representation. That doesn't have to do with Hamilton? It does have to do with Hamilton. Oh, okay. I have a story about Hamilton. Okay. You know this story. I'm going to tell stream this story because this is the story of how uh, I got really mad at the internet several times <laughs> last week and also earlier this year and also in general. Um, oh. Yep. There you go. Penny drops. So uh, Hamilton fandom is lovely and huge and wide ranging. It has, you know, a stunning number of uh, interesting AUs and ask blogs on Tumblr and cartoonists and uh, sort of derivative works for days. It's great. I love it. Love to see it. Um, there was, uh, in particular, uh, a fan artist who became famous or infamous. Notorious. Notorious, I guess. Uh, for their modern AUs of Hamilton characters. In particular, they're one of Thomas Jefferson, which uh, said that, oh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, first of all, the Hamilton version of Thomas Jefferson played by David, David, David Diggs uh, is black, has an afro. It's the full afro for the Jefferson, right? And then it's in a ponytail for Lafayette. Yeah, I think that's it. So I believe you. I they took know. they they took this image of David Diggs as Thomas Jefferson and were like, okay, modern college AU, this character is now trans, and I thought that was great and cool. And they did a concept of this modern Thomas Jefferson with a binder with an extremely extra custom print binder that had Hatsune Miku on it, and like a a, a print of Hatsune Miku on it. And I saw that and I was just so damn delighted that it exists in the world and that we as the custom print binder company like are exist in fandom spaces and in fictional universes as like a thing that you can get custom prints on your binders all the time whenever that that feels good and important to me that we exist in fictional spaces too but like as, as something that you give to a cool or an extra character or a character who you feel like giving this to and for whatever reason, the image of Thomas Jefferson and Hatsune Miku binder went viral. And it went beyond musical fandom and people started going, oh, why is Thomas Jefferson black in this, in this image? Don't they know that he owns slaves? Well, it wasn't even necessarily just that he wasn't white. It was also, oh, you're, you're turning him into a, a Tumblr or SJW. And that's really problematic because he was a racist rapist. And it's like, can you can y'all please like catch up with Hamilton circa 2015 discourse? Go on the comment section of an NPR article from the time and argue there, maybe. Oh, number one fanner says, yes, you're right about him there. Um also, oh my god, I love modern trans Thomas. Yes! <laughs> yes, Thomas Jefferson's Hatsune Miku binder is a wonderful phrase to say, and it's it's art in our times, and it's wonderful, and people harass this artist off the goddamn internet. When I tried to go find them just to say thank you for this thing that they had made this was last like year. a year ago. Yeah, like last year when I tried to go find them and say hi, um, they uh, had deleted and like left a single message on an Instagram being like, fuck you all, I'm out. I didn't sign up to be harassed forever and bullied so bye and i was like god damn it god damn it you their, assholes their twitter hadn't been updated since like 2017 and it's like i i had so many props to them for taking care of their mental health and getting out of the toxic space and also people were now asking us the custom binder company if we could make a hatsune miku binder and the specific print that the artist had designed did not exist on Spoonflower at that time. So it would have been some design work. And also I didn't feel good about making money off of this image that had uh, caused this uh, caused this artist, like, or that had been a target for this artist. So what I said at the time was, if you want to buy it, you can. Uh, we will take your money and we will set it aside and we will pay the artist that amount of money and we will just make it because I want this thing to exist in the world. And just let the artist freaking contact us and set the money aside for them because 
him? Him, I think his pronouns are him. Yeah. And uh, I just wanted this to exist and to have a slightly happier ending. And then last week, someone bought it. <laughs> someone took the time to do the design work, uh, put it on Spoonflower, and purchased this binder. So I immediately reblogged the post like, hey, we owe this artist some cash. Somebody tell me how to get in touch with them if, they, if you know, just so I can get the money. And they did, and we got their contact info, and I reached out to them and asked them how to pay them. Uh, and uh, we'll see what happens there. I mean, God knows... I don't expect anyone to answer their email right away in these particular times. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I reached out to them. I'll set it aside for them, him. I'll reach, set it aside for him, and I'll pay him whenever we can, whenever we know how, and make Thomas Jefferson's Hatsune Miku binder. Can't freaking wait to do that one. It's going to be <laughs> fun. Yeah. I'm, I'm freaking excited to make that one. And of course, I reblogged it on Tumblr, and immediately we got another uh, uh, another member of the Legions who had initially harassed this guy off the internet uh, messaging us in our inbox with like a really nasty uh, message of like graphic about how shitty Thomas Jefferson was, as if we don't know. Yeah. As if that is the point at all. So. I told that person to go argue with their American history teacher or something like that and block them because life's too short and people are jerks and I want this artist to get paid for this wonderful, beautiful thing that is still mimetic. Like every now and again, you see it as a resurgence uh, and people come to our website searching for and asking for a Miku binder because of this image. If you ask me, this artist has already like given us free advertising just by making fan art with custom print binder in it. Yeah. So we're gonna pay him. Yeah. That's my story. That's only tangentially Broadway related, but it is Broadway related because it does come out of Hamilton, and I do enjoy Broadway <laughs> fandom a lot. Like Broadway fandom to me is one of the really interesting fandoms because so many of us have not seen the show that we're so into. We've listened to the soundtrack on repeat a million times. We've looked at GIF sets and promotional materials, and we follow the actors on Twitter. But have we really seen the show? I haven't seen Hamilton. I really want to. I love it. I haven't seen it. And it, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting fandom to me because it's uh, full of people who are uh, one or two or three steps removed from the source. And that also, to me, is a very um, familiar thing because I was a weeb in the 90s. And so uh, being a fan of an anime in the, in the 90s to 2000s and sometimes still today, it's a one or two or three steps away process because you get a translation that isn't great and then you try to find a better one or you learn Japanese if you're a little nerd who has nothing better to do. And then you get a little step closer uh, by finding a better translation or by getting better at your Japanese. And you get a little step closer. And then eventually you feel that you have experienced the actual object. And sometimes you never feel that you have like fully experienced the actual story, the media uh, that was initially released. There are certainly anime that I feel I have not fully experienced, and I'm fluent in Japanese and watch them in the original, but I'm never quite going to get the whole thing of um, Bakumatsuki Kansetsu Irohani Hoeto, that anime about Kabuki, about the Meiji Restoration. <laughs> was it about the Meiji? No, it was earlier than that. It was about um, the Bakumatsu. It was about the, the, end of the, the end of the era, the end of the shogunate. And I think I need like three years of revolutionary Japanese history before I get that show. Uh, Nega Googled Thomas Jefferson Hatsune, Hatsune Miku Binder. We haven't seen it yet. Our Tumblr is the second result. Yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> Can yeah. we find the actual image though? Yeah, the actual image belonged to a Tumblr that uh, the, the artist took down when they. Uh, left Tumblr on account of 
being yeah and they have a it. they have a he has a website now and he is actually uh active on twitter now yeah. but that that picture is nowhere to be found yeah yeah for understandable reasons he's really cool he does really good art he does persona 5 art now yeah yay persona commission that guy yeah i can't relate a whole lot to being that part removed from a <laughs> broadway musical because i've seen most of the ones that i'm fans of yeah because you grew up <laughs> next door to broadway yep and broadway used to be relatively you know cheaper yeah affordable <clears throat> Let me tell you, the most expensive tickets that I remember ever buying, uh, we paid like $80 for front orchestra seats. And now you can't even get back mezzanine seats for under $100. Yeah. Well, what's that show? I don't remember. I might have been Phantom. Mm. Which, I guess, to be fair, even at that point was still had been running for a while. Mm. <clears throat> is it the longest running show yet? Or is it just the longest running open show now that Cats is closed? Um, no, it, it, it hit a uh, longest running musical on Broadway um, after Cats closed. Mm. Which Cats was the one that held that record before. Yeah. <laughs> so Andrew Lloyd Webber just uh overtook himself <laughs> yeah. cats is one of the weird ones for me because i have heard some of the soundtrack i have seen a couple of filmed numbers and i don't and i i know that i'm not supposed to like come away with a fully coherent whole or something that leads from a to b to c but i still just don't get it like every experience I have with cats is one where I come away not understanding what I was supposed to obtain. Which I the guess the old I'm... possum's book yeah. of 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 is it magical cats? Whatever. Yeah. It was the original cat meme. Right. So in that case, I'm supposed to be like, oh, kitty. Basically. But I'm not. He was just. He was just describing cats that you see around the neighborhood. Yeah. The old cat, the cat that begs scraps off of every single person that they pass, you know. God, do you remember when Neko Atsume was a mobile game that everyone was playing and they were all comparing uh, <clears throat> which, which fictional, which digital cats they had in their little digital front yard? And that was like super sweet. I, I never played it, but I really enjoyed watching other people like post screenshots of this or that cat that they had gotten on their front step or in their little kitty tower. And then we lost our cat for a week and change, I think. I think it was just a week. Yeah. But it felt like so much longer. And I realized that uh, going out at night uh, around 10 p.m. to midnight every night for a week, shaking a bag of cat treats, and uh leaving water out and leaving food out and then leaving it was a, even like 2 a.m yeah leaving a, a kitty blanket in a cat trap that was how i started to play neko atsume <laughs> because i started to identify the neighborhood cats and like name them in my head and it was like oh that one's peaches obviously and uh there's that big tabby and i i started to like distinguish them in my head because they would either come up to me or come into the trap to get water or food or whatever and then we got our, our actual cat back. Like we did, in fact, eventually lure him into the feral cat trap. And uh, he returned to us running a fever, missing a tooth with a tick on his face. But he came. He came back. We got Practical him. cats. The old possum's book of practical cats. <laughs> Sorry. It's totally fine. <laughs> I, was, I was finishing my story anyways. And like, also, that's, yeah. I feel like a certain way about seeing cats on the street and that way is generally positive and like seeing strays and even that, that goddamn cat that 
tripped the trap like three times before Rennie did that I got familiar with and I would come up to the trap and go, what, again? And then open it and it would shoot off into the night. Uh, you know, I had some affection for that beast. Mm-hmm. I don't hold any affection for Broadway dancers and furry leg warmers. I, I don't I mean, it's I not necessarily it. supposed to be affection. It's okay. just supposed to be like, oh, yeah, that's how a certain breed of cat acts. You know, the mischievous ones, the the, the roly-boly ones who just want treats. Mm. Buster for Jones is Tubbs. Buster for Jones is Tubbs the cat. Okay. <laughs> it is just about 4.30. Yep. I'm gonna turn a few more of these and then maybe go eat another food. Also, I just want to say, I haven't seen the Cats movie. I have seen a review of it that went through the whole plot. And the the plot of the Cats movie, like the whole structure of that movie is not the musical. <laughs> Obligatory disowning the movie. Like, they, I don't know. They, they, they tried to make it even more uh, structured, which doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't seem like the point, yeah. Yeah, it isn't the point. Like, people had to force Andrew Lloyd Webber to make it as structured as it currently is. And also, all the, the horrible Seth Rogen and uh, Rebel Wilson style comedy does not exist <laughs> in the musical. Oh my god, they put all. that in there? Well, yeah, they're in it. Oh. <laughs> the two of them are in it. Oh. Wow. My my interest in it was already negative, but it just it flowed. All I know about cats is the song number is they're called Jellico Cats. I don't know what that means though. You're not supposed to. <laughs> it's like it's like the Jabberwock. It's it's a complete nonsense word. Was Cats Andrew Lloyd Webber's Kublai Khan? I don't know what, what Kublai Khan is. The the poem. Um and Xanadu did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure dome degree decree. Uh, Samuel Coleridge wrote this poem that was essentially like just an absolute opium fueled. Um, well, Andrew Lloyd Webber did not page. write anything. He put music and staged a bunch of T.S. Eliot poems. He didn't like string them together or make a plot out of them or like any plot or the, like the guy he didn't who, add anything the guy who was working with him on staging the show mm. um added the part about the heaviside layer and whatever uh but no <laughs> okay so the script is just straight up yeah the huh. uh, every single lyric in that show okay and there are very 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 few parts just like in phantom yeah. In Joseph and whatever yeah, that cool. have actual dialogue. Um, hmm. Even uh, Grizabella, which I had been under the impression that he created her. Uh, apparently, what actually happened was that the Grizabella poem was originally written by T.S. Eliot. Huh. Um, he just decided not to include it in uh, the published collection because it was darker and he intended it for, he intended the collection for children. Um, and he just didn't think it was appropriate. And um, Angela Weber was in contact with T.S. Eliot's wife at the time. And she not only signed off on all of this, she gave him that, a copy of that poem uh -huh. uh, to include in the eventual stage production. Neat. I do enjoy that musicals are, are uh, like, I think the best, many of the best ones, if not all of the best ones, are um, really good uh, transformative works. Mm -hmm. Like, 
this is something that they that a musical format does really well is that it it, it takes something that we are the, the the audience is possibly potentially uh, familiar with as a text uh, revamps it so you don't have to be familiar with the original text but also transforms it into something different ish mm -hmm. and even when it's an original musical like uh, the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee that was a transformation of the thing the spelling bee uh -huh. like it was it was a, a remix of an actual spelling bee which is in its way a performance and the musical made that point mm -hmm. Asking about feelings or thoughts about rent. So, <laughs> listen, rent might have been the first. Oh, no, oh, it's into the woods. Over here. Yeah, rent was one of the first uh, musicals that I heard lyrics from, because the lyrics to rent reached even into uh, the central Texas public schools of my youth, and. Um, I didn't get it then, I didn't get much about it then. I was severely closeted until 19. That's just a fact about me. But when I did finally like hear Rent all the way through, I was in college and freshly out of the closet and it felt like the best thing ever, as it does to kids who are just discovering that uh, uh, straight is a word and that you don't have to be it. I mean, for me, you know, I I figured things out even later than 19. Um, but I do remember, you know, I was I was in that whole musical Broadway world, and I remember when Rent came out, um, and I remember going to see it, and it was so different from anything else going on at the time. Mm. Um, just the, not just the music, which like, you know, I know in, in 2020, you know, everybody does rock musicals, but at the time you say rock musical and everybody thinks of Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and it was the first time, really, that people acknowledged that not straight people existed on Broadway, which was, I mean, it, again, it was kind of huge just because so much of queer New York City exists in the theater industry. Um, yeah, and I think, like, you know, it might have been kind of shallow looking back on it. Um, <clears throat> it is apparently cribbed from a book by a lesbian, the story. Was it? Yeah, it was stolen. Uh, the, the story is, is, is stolen wholesale, and then uh, the main character, um, cameraman, narrator, Mark, Mark uh, is added in on top of uh, uh, apparently a better book. Uh -huh. um, so there's that. There's that. I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not going to sit here and claim that it's not problematic in many and sundry ways, Truly. or that it's not. Uh, again, sort of shallow on its in, intended message. Yeah. And also, like you can be all those things and still be hugely important and influential to a lot of people, especially in the time. Right. It's like it's like Buffy. <laughs> You know, yeah. Joss Whedon is yeah, a horrible is. person. Yeah, he is. He has treated actresses in really awful, disgusting ways. And he has a strong cheerleader fetish that is completely obvious to us in 2020. Um, but back in what, 1995, sure. 
97? Yeah, ish. Uh, Buffy was really revolutionary. Mm. Uh, you didn't really see female characters that got to kick people's asses mm. on TV. And that, you know, that's important for the people who were experiencing that at the time. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I like that. It really is. It's like it's like Buffy in a lot of ways. And I also like I really enjoy discussions about how problematic rent is because it does make me feel like we have uh, reached like the the best thing that could happen to rent, I think, is that it would outlive its usefulness. Mm -hmm. Like if what rent did was uh, make such a, an impact or participate in a huge impact and a huge cultural shift to the point that now it looks dated and kind of annoying and gross. It's like, great, perfect. That's what I want, honestly, is I want Rent to look dated and annoying and gross and like a cis gay dude uh, cribbed from his more talented uh, trans and lesbian friends. Uh, and now we all know it. Like that's, yeah, that's- I my... think he was bisexual. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Uh, and also, like, the more nuanced discussions I see of Hamilton make me feel like maybe Hamilton is going to end up that way. Like, oh, maybe sure we're, what we're going to see... going to become old hands. Yeah. yeah. And what we're going to see is, like, oh, Hamilton was hugely influential in its time and could have been better in the way it dealt with a historical account of slavery. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that's probably the, the, the base summary of a lot of Hamilton is problematic talk uh, and, like, discussion and general stuff is, like, here's how it fell down on talking about slavery and not talking about slavery as a musical about the, uh, about the American Revolution specifically cast with a bunch of Black people. Like, it had a, 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 arguably a duty that it fell down on and here's maybe what it could have done better. But now in the moment, uh, the response to that is often Hamilton could not have done that better because if Hamilton had been any more about slavery than it already was, it would not have gotten that popular. Yeah. And as many people would not have seen it, it would not have gone on tour. It would not have been as popular among white people across the dang country. So I think I also see this argument on rent is that rent could not have been kinder to trans people, Rent could not have been more radical in its treatment of AIDS, because if Rent had been more radical in its treatment of AIDS, it would not have become such a smash hit. And I don't know if that's true, but I see that argument being made. I I mean, let's see. Name me another musical about AIDS. Yeah. <laughs> Name me another musical who that has a trans character as a main character. <laughs> there were several, and they're all, like, obscure now. You can find them in history archives and in, like, zines that reference the scripts of things uh -huh. that never made it to Broadway or even to off-Broadway. There were many. Like, no, yeah, and there the still are that, many. The only but, one that comes to mind yeah. that has a trans, arguably trans woman as the main character is Edwig and the Ingredient. Uh, Kinky Boots. Well, is that, Kinky that's Boots, drag. Tr Kinky Boots is a drag queen. Okay, thank you. So is Priscilla and... So like Queen of the Desert. Okay. Like I was gonna say, if you give me the option between the half a dozen drag queen musicals on Broadway right now and Rent, I will choose Rent every time. Yeah, and that's also a, I think it's an open question. Is it an open question? Uh, in the original Rent, mm -hmm. is Angel a trans woman or a drag queen, or is it is that distinction not available to us at the time? Um. So the musical was supposed to take place in the late 80s, right? right? Because it's smack dab in the middle of the AIDS crisis. Right. <clears throat> or maybe not smack dab in the middle, but right. regardless, it's, it's still it's there. It's running. Um, and I don't know. My understanding is that there was not a strong, on decisive distinction at the time between a trans woman and 
a assigned an assigned male at birth person who spent who basically lived their life presenting as a woman and speaking about themselves as a woman right yeah like the 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 active distinction of like are they in is 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 she in drag or is she a trans woman is i think it's yeah i think they made it more explicit in the movie um the original movie no, the movie the, the one movie, movie that yeah. exists okay um but the it is true that during the um, the funeral scene, mm. uh, they do correct their pronouns. Yeah, when she. they're talking about her. Yeah. Yeah, to she. Yeah. Yeah, which feels like this is definitely a a trans woman as we understand those words now. Yeah. It's interesting and difficult. Uh, yeah. And fun, also, to me at least, to uh, talk about uh, in the sense of there's, uh, this is a, a history that's actively evolving before our eyes, and uh, the way we process rent now is, I think, different from the way uh, people processed rent when it came out. Yeah, and like, even, yeah, just the, the language itself, right? The, the language that we use today is even completely different from the language that we used and the way that we understood it when the show came out, when it was like super popular. Yeah, there was um, something in La Vie Boheme that uh, I always remember that when they're when they're toasting to people, when they're, they're I mean, they toast to people for like half that song, I know, but uh, they're, uh, They, they they go into uh the, the line starts two bisexuals two trisexuals two bisexuals trisexuals homo sapiens carcinogens hallucinogens men Dewey Herman yeah so the the progression from bisexual to trisexual there has like always caught at me I think maybe it might have been my first exposure beyond the gender binary was that line <laughs> it was like wait wait you can be trisexual what's the third option God, yeah, I might have, that might have caught at me when I was in like high school. Uh -huh. I was like, oh, wait, what? What is that? How do you do that? What's, what's the deal there? <laughs> and um, yeah, there, there was, that's a word that we don't hear very much anymore is trisexual. There's a whole lot of discourse between uh, bisexual and pansexual uh, and polysexual is also a word that uh, doesn't really, there's polyamorous, but that means something else. Polysexual and trisexual have fallen out mm -hmm. uh, of whatever circulation I, they were in. I hear polysexual um, sometimes just used as a catch-all mm. for bisexual, pansexual, whatever. Yeah, but I really enjoy trisexual. Uh -huh. I, it's some, there's something about that. that uh, maybe it's just because it was one of those like young, severely closeted central Texan me uh, caught at that. I was like, wait, what? Attracted to Triton. <laughs> Attracted to Tritons. And that too is, I think, one of the hugely redeeming things about Rent is that it reached us down south. It reached us out west. It reached us far beyond uh, the Broadway area where everybody was sort of queer but didn't talk about it or was queer and didn't talk about it, uh, Rent talked about it. And so those of us who didn't know that anything coming out of Broadway was made by a gay person, and I did not know that, like, you laugh. I didn't know that Into the Woods had anything to do with any gay people at all. I didn't know that uh, any anything from Broadway was gay. Like, that didn't hit my radar at all it was just like oh these are these are stories that people sing about them okay whatever it's, it's a singing theater great um there was that general association of oh if you're a man and you're singing you must be you must be a uh, sissy or whatever but it didn't well yeah yeah but it didn't like it didn't like <laughs> register to me like these are actual factual right. people making this thing and then rent hit my consciousness and i was like ah you can you can sing about being gay. 
it. You can sing and be gay. You can like tell stories about being gay right now and in this time. Yeah, that's that's the other thing about Rent is like, you know, so so much of musical theater, um, especially the stuff that starts out on Broadway, uh, is written about New York. Um, but at the time, most of the shows that were written about New York were about this, you know, idealized 1940s, you know, glamorous idea of New York. And I think Rent was really one of the first really popular musicals that talked about a New York that was actually kind of shitty. <laughs> <laughs> And I do think also, here's the other thing, uh, in this age of small creators and great representation, I think it's probably hard to remember or imagine that Rent came into a world where you could not find a gay person anywhere in media. I could not find one on television. I or mean, maybe if you did, was, they were jokes. They were jokes. They were the butts of jokes. All and, you know, them. they weren't explicitly gay, but you know, you know. But you know. <laughs> Right. So the, I mean, it's, it's trite to say representation matters. And nowadays when we have such a, a wealth of it, uh, we talk about like how you can make that representation better and please stop killing all your lesbians and other things. Uh, at the time, that scrap was water in a desert. And I will never stop being affectionate for rent for that and i think a lot of people feel the same way about uh the rocky horror picture show yeah is that it was water in a desert and going to rocky showings was uh there was a chance a rare delightful chance uh Mayo says they have a friend who's polysexual and they use it to mean attraction to everyone but men same <laughs> Uh, Kira SP says they have to get to work. Thanks for streaming. Bye. Thanks for, for watching. Bye. I think that's about it for me, too, because I'm getting really hungry. Uh, that's fair. You so, probably have some sort of food. Yeah, I think it is time for us to say goodbye. Thank you for coming and hanging out with us again. It's really, really nice to see y'all in chat and to hang out and to talk about things and to, yeah chill out while we prep stuff for next week's round of mask making. I hope you're all staying well. Go watch the Phantom of the Opera 25th anniversary concert for free on YouTube while you can. It's very good. Is it on YouTube or Netflix? Um, it is on Netflix, but if you don't have an account on Netflix, uh, with Netflix, you can watch it now on YouTube. Nice. Nice. Excellent. Do that thing. Do that thing and tell us which weird pronunciations you notice because <laughs> now i'm curious sierra bo just plays christine all right yeah <laughs> tell us tell us what christine is doing weird because i want to talk about it bye bye